So what I've done um, is I've dropped a couple of links into a PDF form that is um, some reading lists and people that you can follow because it's clear that the protests that are going on around the country are, are not about one man who's been killed. I think it's, um, of course, it's a much bigger issue. So because this small press author reading series is about um, connecting and it's about um, listening to stories that are not in the mainstream, I have put a couple of links, one to well-read black girl who is, um, she's got a wonderful Instagram feed and she also runs a lot of book clubs on uh, black women in literature. And, and so that would be a wonderful place to begin to check out some stories that maybe you're not familiar with. And another link is to the bookshop.org anti-racist reading list. And that is a hat tip to Amy Shearing because I saw her post it the other day on social media. And it's another excellent place to access stories that you're, you may not be familiar with. So um, that's the first thing that I wanted to do because it's such an important part of our um, history right now. And I wanted to recognize that. So with that said, um, my name is Christy Craig and I am the publisher at Hidden Timber Books. And I'm so happy that you're here today. This is gonna be a lot of fun. We have a short story panel for um, Acknowledging Short Story Month, which is the month of May. And that's been going on, I think, for 13 years, maybe. I think since 2007, something like that. And um, I've invited some wonderful authors today. Uh, some of them I know, some of them are new to me, and I'm super excited you're here. Um, again, if you've got any tech troubles, just um, check out the chat box, send me a note, and um, I will get to that and try to figure out what I can do to help. It looks like somebody's having some trouble joining, so I'll certainly get to that in just a second. When we get to the Q&A, you can drop a note in the chat box with your question or that you've got a question, or you can use the participant window to raise your hand, and uh, we will have questions and answers towards the end of the reading. This is going to be recorded just so you know, but your faces and your names will be anonymous when we put the recording up, so you don't have to worry about that. And then again, I've, I'll have a PDF that I'll put in the chat box for you that's got all sorts of links to the authors that you're gonna see today, their books that are out or coming up, and um, recommended reading and things like that. So thank you to Amy Shern, Sin Vargas, and Rachel Hall for being here to read your works. And a special thanks to Patricia Ann McNair for moderating the panel today. Just to give you a little bit of information about Patricia Ann, her essay collection, and these are the good times, was a Montaigne Medal finalist. The Temple of Air, which is a collection of short stories, won the Southern Illinois University Devil's Kitchen Readers Award. It also won the Chicago Writers Association Book of the Year. And it was a finalist for the Society of Midland Authors Fiction Award. So you are all in very good hands. And um, she has a new collection, Responsible Adults, that is forthcoming from Cornerstone Press, which is actually a press located here in Wisconsin. And she is the director of the undergraduate creative writing program at Columbia College in Chicago. So I have read much of Patty's work. And um, like I said, you're all in very good hands. I'm super excited to have you here. And I will pass the baton to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christy. Thank you to you and to Hidden Books and to Rachel and Amy and Sin for um, inviting me to be part of this conversation. And just so you all know, those of you who are here, and I see a number of familiar faces, which is really exciting from various places close down the road from me in Chicago and some further away um, than that even. It's nice to see you all. Um, we do mean for this to be a conversation when we get to that part. So I hope that you, as you listen to the work of these wonderful writers, that you consider what might be some questions that you would want to ask them as we go along. Um, I am a lifelong lover of the short story from when I was a little girl and, and reading Edgar Allan Poe stories, those sorts of things. Always loved that form. Um, and I have been a long time writer of short stories as well. And, uh, I consider myself almost like an advocate for the short story. Um, so I'm hoping that you all feel that way too, and that's part of the reason why you're here today. So we really look forward to um, having a conversation with you. 
And just to get our juices, our creative juices, our listening juices going, um, we're going to hear from these writers first. They're each going to read uh, some from their short fiction, and, uh, and then we're going to move into the Q&A. So uh, be prepared to join into that, in that conversation when we get there. So first we're going to hear from Amy Sheeran. She's a writer and editor who lives in Brooklyn. Her third novel, uh, a ghost story called Unseen City, comes out in September from Red Hen Press. She's the New York fiction editor at Joyland Magazine, and she's the senior editor at Forge Magazine. So please welcome Amy Sheeran. Thank you so much. That's so lovely. Look, I have my book right here. What? I just got galleys. Pre-order. It's uh, coming out in September. <clears throat> and um, it is a, a novel. I have a collection of short stories that I have tried to interest people in. And so maybe that's a question I have for some of you guys. Um, what do I do with that? Um, I've had better luck with novels for whatever reasons. But um, I was going to read this short story that I can actually, ooh, let me see if this works. I can drop the link in the chat because it was just published um, on April 4th in this publication called People Holding. Um, dropping the link, I don't know if you guys can click on it because this publication is so much fun. They send everybody, um, they send all the contributors a picture of people holding something and then ask you to write a story about it, which is such a great prompt. Um, and so this is this little story I wrote. <clears throat> In case you can't see the picture, it's this group of very amazing like 1960s ladies with really hairsprayed hair and like wonderful um, outfits. I feel like they look exactly like like my grandmother's friends in Skokie, Illinois, like 1970, 1963 maybe. Um, and one of them is holding a pair of sunglasses. That's all you need to know. Okay. Um, can you guys hear me okay? I should have started with that. Okay. All right. Oh, and apologies. It's about a virus. Okay. <clears throat> Listen, I wasn't even worried about catching it. None of us were. That's the thing. Honestly, I thought the whole thing was overblown. Even though at our weekly luncheon at Marshall Fields, Carol kept saying, well, she heard on the news this, and her neighbor, whose cousin is a doctor, said that. And at the school where she's a secretary, people were pulling their kids out and la la la. It'll make your face fall off. It'll carve out your insides. Carol thinks we want to hear all of this as we're still passing around the communal plate of pickles. Carol only comes to the luncheons because she's Susan's niece, and we felt sorry for her when she moved to town and was all alone, 23 and still not married, you worry. So finally, Rita, always cracking lies, says, well, we know Carol doesn't have it. <clears throat> and we laugh a lot at that because we heard one of the symptoms is you lose your voice, see? Carol never stops talking, even though, as I made clear, she's a pity invite. Maybe Carol should get it. I'm joking, relax. It's not even like it even seemed that bad. I mean, unless you got it so bad you died, of course, but who would do that? I heard it makes your tongue turn blue like a chow chow, which is like weird, but also who cares? Another symptom is your hair curls. Seems fine, honestly, even kind of fun. Another one is loss of appetite. Quieting down, getting a free perm, slimming down. It's bound to get a lot of gals hitched, cracks Rita, poking a manicured finger into her cloud of tangerine hair. I would kill for her volume. Honestly, I would. I mean, not literally, but like literally. <clears throat> My daughter Lori is clearly unaffected, I think, as I watch her scarf down her sandwich. She's even eating the fries. I hope she doesn't get too heavy now that she's married. But oh wait, maybe she's pregnant is my happy thought. But I'll ask her about it later because I've been accused lately, me, of being a loudmouth. Who, me? I loud whispered when Lori, when Lori said it. And she laughed and forgave me, I think. What can I say? I like to live out loud, in color. I'm always finding something fun to wear, even when Rita rolls her eyes at my get-ups. But hey, life is short, you know? Anyway, I think I go even louder and brighter when I meet my luncheon ladies, because I know it riles them up. And what can I say? They could use some riling. I mean, look, we could all use some riling. And heaven knows our mahjong groups and golfing husbands aren't going to do it for us. Rita slurps her iced tea and said, 
and says, I heard you can get it from surfaces. Like if someone touches your things, and they have it. Rita also reads the tabloids they sell at the supermarket checkout lanes and told me you can get it from takeout lo mein. So I'm just saying fed to Rita's medical knowledge, you know? That's ridiculous, mutters Carol, who, as we've discussed, knows everything all the time. Amazing that secretarial school also makes you an epidemiologist. <clears throat> Although I did hear that it'll make your eyelashes fall out. Anyway, it's a cough that you have to look for. Rita is at that very moment coughing into her napkin and sees us looking at her and laughs and coughs again and then waves the napkin over the table, which is honestly not that cute. Not that I'm worried, just ew. Lori takes a break from her romantic relationship with her turkey club, something is definitely up with that girl, and says, I heard it was like a biological weapon thing spread by the Russians. And at the look we all give her, she goes, what? I heard that. Susan pushes her chicken salad around on her plate until it looks like a crime scene. I heard you can have it and not even know you have it. And that, whoever heard of such a thing, we shush her and move on to the more pressing gossip because that country club locker room story is not going to tell itself. And it's fine, and we needle each other, and we laugh, and Rita coughs some more, and no one orders dessert. And then Rita says, oh, oh, she has a new camera. And wouldn't it be fun to have the waiter take our picture? And sure, okay. And at the last minute, she grabs my sunglasses off my face and says, oh, silly, don't wear those in the picture. After the photograph gets snapped, she tries to hand me back my sunglasses and I stare at her hands and I say, you know what? She can keep them and never really liked those sunglasses anyway. Uh, that's the end of the story, which I should have told you is called The Last Time We Saw Rita. Thanks. I'm gonna mute. Bye. Thank you, Amy. Just a little topical. Thanks for that. Um, Next, we're going to be hearing from Rachel Hall. Rachel Hall is the author of Heirlooms from BKMK Press, um, which was selected by Marge Piercy for the G.S. Sharat Chandra Prize. She's a professor of English at SUNY Geneseo and lives in Rochester, New York. She's at work on a collection of stories about gun violence. Please welcome <coughs> Rachel Hall. Hello, thank you. Um, thanks so much for organizing this, Christy, and for uh, and helping us along here, Patricia. This is great, and for all of you joining at home, <laughs> um, I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm going to read um, um, from a new story, um, and I'm going to start kind of in the middle of it. So um, I think all you really need to know, though, is that the point of view is omniscient and it moves around from uh, the teacher, Miss Herman, to her students, to their parents. And the story begins on the first day back at an elementary school after a school shooting. Um, and this is um, from my new collection in progress, which I'm calling Recoil right now. Um, and this story is called After. So, After. The school was built in the 1960s, and its interior reflects the hopeful pedagogical vision of that time. It was believed that children benefited from space and openness, collaboration and experimentation. So the classrooms opened up to each other on either side, Instead of solid walls, there were folding partitions that could be opened and closed. In more recent decades, as pedagogy has changed and shifted, and let's face it, American test scores plummeted, walls were added, corridors constructed, so the school is a maze, difficult to navigate. Already, plans are being drawn up for a new school, one with a simple layout, and many well-labeled options for egress. For now, this building will have to do. Everything has been cleaned and scoured. The floors have been waxed and buffed to a high shine as they are at the beginning of each school year and again after winter break. The double doors of the music room's entrance have been walled over. Maintenance has done an impressive job, the second grade teacher 
Miss Herman thinks. The paint is the same pale blue as the rest of the hallway. If you didn't know a classroom was there, blonde wood shelves, risers for the chairs, a mural of New York State's music grates on the rear wall, you'd never guess. The entryway smells of fresh paint and underneath that paste and the sharp tinny smell of steam table green beans. There are two ways in which Miss Herman is not suited for her profession. Her great height for one, she's over six feet tall, which requires near gymnastic bending and crouching to see eye to eye with her charges. Then there is her preference for quiet. She'd been a bookish only child of two school teachers. Her game of choice was playing school with her dolls. She never considered another career. She wonders though, why no one mentioned the exuberance and clamor of children, suggested this might be a challenge for her. Her students wriggle and squirm. They spin and run and fall and leap up. They touch their toes simply because they can. They like to pick up the smallest child in the class and carry her around. Ms. Herman has grown accustomed to the hubbub after seven years of teaching. Still, she loves her students best when they are hard at work, their heads bent over their desks in silent concentration. Today, the children are subdued, their line orderly, their hands to themselves. They examine their possessions in their new clear backpacks. One child shakes hers like a snow globe, watches the loose change settle at the bottom. In Ms. Herman's classroom, the desks that are no longer needed have been cleaned out and removed to the district's warehouse. Her classroom feels empty, too big. So she's created a reading nook brought in several beanbag chairs and a round braided rug. The bulletin board in this corner reads, April showers bring May flowers. Later today, they will make flowers from watercolored coffee filters and pipe cleaners. Each child will plant their blossom beneath the banner. As her students file into her classroom, Ms. Herman can't help but remember them filing out their eyes squeezed shut as instructed, their hands on the shoulder of the student in front of them, trusting the adults in front to lead them to safety. It is referred to as the incident. In memorandum and public announcements and in interviews with journalists, school officials and police have modeled this language for the families. The media naturally prefers other words, massacre, killing spree, tragedy. The experts call it an intentional mass casualty event. The parents can't remember this phrase, it's icy abstraction, no matter how many times they hear it. What do the children call it? The parents try to get their children to talk but they hardly speak of it after the tearful, frenzied reunion in the school parking lot. This has the effect of making the parents feel awkward around their children, hesitant. They hug them too tight, too often, resort to old nicknames and terms of endearment, beanie, choo-choo, sweet pea. The children's faces seem changed, older, haggard, as if they are their own grandfathers or great grandfathers who returned home from their generation's wars and refused to speak of what they saw there. Weary stoics, the children hunched their small shoulders as if against cold. For the children, this time after the incident is stretched out and wobbly. How long have they been home? Days melt into each other. For a while, Hazel is allowed to stay in her pajamas and watch movies on TV as if she is ill. Her mother has been especially solicitous too, asking if Hazel needs anything, chocolate milk, a popsicle. 
Does she want to talk? It's all right to cry, she says. In the utility closet, her thighs clammy with pee, Hazel had gone through that week's spelling words. Gladly, proudly, softly, loudly, care, echo, case, simple. Silently, she spelled them out two times. When she finished, she started over. She knows those words well, can use each one correctly in a sentence, but she cannot think now how to answer her mother. The parents wonder how they will be able to send their children back. It's like boarding, it's like boarding a plane wreck and expecting to reach your destination. Or is it more like flying after a recent crash, safer because of increased vigilance? There is some talk of homeschooling. One family is making plans to move to Canada. It's only at night that the parents feel they are of any help. The children wake, stumble to their parents' beds, snuggle in between them, and drift off, thus bolstered. The parents know this is the only safety they can provide and that it is insufficient. They watch their children sleep, the soft flicker of dreams beneath their eyelids, their chests rising and falling, the delicate knit of rib beneath the skin. Such beauty, it could break your heart. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. That's haunting and lovely. Next, we're going to hear from Sin Vargas. Sin Vargas's first book, On the Way, won accolades from Book Scrolling's best short story collections of all time, New City Lit's top five fiction books by Chicago authors, and Bustle's 11 short story collections your book club will love. So if you're book clubbers, <laughs> make sure to reach out to Sin. She lives in Chicago and is working on her first novel. And I just want to say that she is one of the Columbia College contingent of whom I see many in the audience today. So please welcome. Sin Vargas. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks to Christy and Patty and Rachel and Amy. I'm really happy to be here. Okay. When I learned that dad was sleeping at the church, I went to go see him. Sanctuary is what I think they called it. It's what I learned in history class about the refugees. They sought sanctuary in churches because God's house was safe. Dad was some kind of refugee now at least for mom. The empty church was 10 times bigger and reminded me of the places in the vampire movies. Quiet, alone, the pews cold and the stained glass without color, all just framed blobs. I stopped in front of the altar, it covered in white cloth. It seemed to shine on its own, a pure white. I knew dad wasn't sleeping underneath it, but I pictured him there anyway, like the homeless guys living in boxes that once held a fridge or a stove. I had never been in church alone before. I looked up and there were paintings floating against the dark walls, angel wings moving and God and Jesus there holding hands. Everyone looked so happy. None of them looked like me. God with his blondish hair and Jesus with his blue eyes. Father and son, the Virgin Mary looking at them, smiling, but separate, fat little babies on clouds. God, I said out loud, and it sounded weird. I don't think I had ever spoken to God out loud before. I don't understand. And I thought I had said that part in my head, but I heard a small echo twirl around the altar. I didn't understand why dad did what he did, why he was living here now. When would mom let him back home if she ever did? Last week I had my family. I knew, I knew who they were, where they were, and now I didn't know what was going to happen. Was this the new way it was going to be? Eshel, I turned and saw Father Joe. He was wearing jeans and a shirt with the priesting around his neck. It's very good to see you. Your dad will be so happy, he smiled. Hi, Father. I did the sign of the cross because it felt like that's what I was supposed to do. I didn't mean to interrupt your prayer. 
And I wanted to tell him that I wasn't praying. I wasn't sure what I was doing, but it wasn't praying, that God wouldn't listen to me anyway. Follow me, your dad is staying in my office. I followed him through the hallways of the house that was attached to the church. I had only seen that part of the building from the outside. When I was little, I pictured the nuns and priests playing Scrabble with only holy words and drinking the church wine. Father Joe knocked on his office door and opened it. There was dad sitting on the couch, eating out of a Burger King bag, fries hanging out of his mouth, his work boots side by side next to Father Joe's desk. Ishel came to see you, Father Joe said, and moved to the side so that I could walk in. Dad ripped the rest of the fry off, put it back in the bag and wiped his hands on his pants. Father Joe closed the door behind me, his footsteps faded. Ishel, Dad said, standing up, and I think he wanted to hug me and I wanted him to, but I didn't move my feet, so neither did he. How was school? His voice was low and unsure. Dad was dad and still not dad at all. Why, Dad? I wanted to know why he did it. Didn't he love us anymore? Lovey told me that you found out about us. You knew since Friday. Dad said not looking at me and instead sat back down on the couch. He reached over to the desk and grabbed the cigarette box that was on top of the wallet I gave him last year for Father's Day. He wasn't hiding that he was smoking again. When he lit it, he exhaled almost immediately. Mom hated cigarette smoke. She said it just didn't kill the one who was smoking. The cigarette smoke rising from the ashtray under the cot created a fog around his feet. I wondered if a hundred cigarettes would make enough smoke for his feet to disappear. I'm sorry, Ishal. I'm sorry you had to keep that to yourself all weekend. I watched him rub his hands like he wanted his skin to fall off, and still the cigarette managed not to burn him. I heard footsteps above us. I wondered if it was one of the fathers or one of the nuns. The window started to tremble with the growing wind outside. That's when I noticed the mug there on the ledge, number one priest in bold black letters with a T in shape of a cross. Father Joe let me use it, Dad said, finally looking at me. I almost asked him what was in it. Why did you cheat with Lovey? The words made their way towards the bookcases and bounced off the Bibles and dark cues with skinny old lettering. Those words pinballed between the plastic bottles and shapes of saints and the Virgin Mary that were probably filled with holy water. The bookshelves twisted slightly when I finally took a deep breath and said, how could you do that to mom? How could you go with that gringa of all people? Did you want the opposite of mom? Some blonde with blue eyes? Does she even know what she did to your family, what you both did? Did you tell her about our family movie nights, how mom took care of you when you hurt your hand last year? After that, I heard my voice but couldn't make out the words. The footsteps stopped upstairs. The bottles of holy water seemed to gather together and whisper what they had just witnessed. The cigarette smoke around dad's feet like coil. Stop, he shall stop. And everything stopped. I stopped until the footsteps above us began again. The clock and shape of a communion wafer said it had been 10 minutes since the last time either dad or I said anything. I didn't want to sit close to him, so I sat on the floor near the door. That seemed to make him feel even worse. He started to wipe his eyes. I'm sorry, Ishel. I'm sorry I did that to you and your mom. And he kept his face in his hands. He blended in with the blue couch. The wind outside rattled the windows more. The Burger King bag now wet with grease on the bottom. Dad hated cold fries. I got up and sat next to him on the couch. I was so mad at him when he grabbed my hand and cried, sorry, 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 until the clock moved onto the next hour. Thank you. Thank you, Sin. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Amy. Hearing you all read makes me want to write. <laughs> So maybe I'll just go right and you guys can have a conversation without me, but no, we will have a conversation and I have some questions. Um, I have lots of questions. I have more questions after hearing you all read as well. And I'm hoping that those of you who are listening have questions too and will join in on, on asking these questions anytime. You can use the chat or you can raise your hand and we'll be keeping our eye out for those so we can make sure that you're part of our conversation. Um, but I thought, because this is short story month, this is the end of short story month, and the short story is often um, a misunderstood beast of creation, I think. Um, 
I'm curious for each of you, um, if when you begin a story, do you know that it's a short story? Uh, or do you, are you aware that it wants to be short? Or sometimes do you think you're working towards something that's longer and then realize that it should be a short story? And when and how do you recognize that it really should be a short story that you're doing? And I think we'll, we'll start with Sin first. On the spot, okay. <laughs> Um, I think anytime I start a piece, it's always a short story. I just, it's, um, the long, long form doesn't come natural to me. So for me, everything is a short story. Um, but I just take it as long as it wants me to take it. So that can be, you know, I've done flash fiction under a thousand words and I'm working on a novel now, which I think is really just a whole bunch of short stories together. Um, so for me, I just, I go with it, but it, it's always a short story. I don't think if it can, you know, I don't think of it as it being a long form as soon as I start writing. So even as you start to move toward it, it becomes, I mean, it's immediately a short, you know, it's a short story. You have an idea for a short story and then there, there it starts to appear as a short story. Yes. Like, and, and even with the novel I'm working on, it makes it easier for me to think of the chapters as standalone short stories. Mm -hmm. Then my mind can wrap that I have to do 80,000 words that way. If I think of it as one long 80,000 word story, it's not gonna, it doesn't work for me. Right, right. I think we have some short stories and story writers in the audience. In fact, I know we do. I can see a lot of nodding going on. And Rachel, you're nodding as well. So yeah. do you know that it's a short story when you start it? Um, yes, L like Sin, it's always a short story for me. Um, and, uh, I think, I mean, once I thought something was longer and, you know, and tried to write a novel, but I think I'm really just a short story writer and um, that, that's, you know, what I love to read and that's what stories seem to come to me in. I think if you, if you read them enough, then that's sort of the shape that, that, you, that your ideas fall into. So I, I always tell my students in a, in a creative writing workshop when we're working on fiction that it's great to read novels, but that you need to read short stories to sort of learn the form, right? To learn that, um, that ri the rhythm of a short story. So we're going to come back to you, Rachel, after a while to find out what are some of those short stories that you tell your students to read and others to read as well. Great. But I, I, I want Amy to answer this question too, because you're primarily a novelist. Um, and so I'm just wondering, how do you know the difference between when you start to move toward a short story um, or when you're moving toward a novel or do they ever intersect? Yeah, it's such a good question. And I feel like I'm trying to um, think of a way to word it that doesn't sound psychotic because as like all the writers here probably know, there's that thing where um, I feel like I start, I'm, I'm like a magpie writer. Like I start, uh, get, you know, I'll be like, Ooh, that's a good image. Oh, that's a good, I want somebody to say that that's a character idea. And there's like a gathering time and then, um, and then it's like the characters kind of start talking and, and, uh, and it's like when it's read, when you're ready to start, you know, you're ready to start none of that is useful information. I don't know. Um, but I do think, I mean, my thing is, I think, no, I'm going to say novels are much easier to write than short stories. So I'm like in awe of true short story writers, because I feel like for me, when I start, a sh if I sh start a short story, I can kind of see the end of it. You know, you can like hold it in your head all at once. Um, and I'm one of those people who, except for that thing that I just read, and then I have one story that's like morphing into one of those horrible lengths that nobody wants, like 40 pages. What is that? That's, it's not anything. Um, but usually they're very much like 18 pages. <laughs> it's like, they're all like the same size. Um, but like, I feel like a short story. Yeah. Before I start, I, if I don't know everything that's going to happen, I at least have to know where it's going to go or what it's going to do. And in a novel, you can just keep going and going and figure it out as you go. It's just, honestly, it's so much easier, you guys. <laughs> you just have to go for longer. <laughs> but 
I don't know. I didn't really answer your question, but no, on. no, I think you did. I think, yeah. And that, that, that idea of allowing yourself the space to discover and having the space to discover in a longer work, I think is really interesting. I think it's also some of that too is behind the short stories that we're making too. We think we're moving toward one thing and then something happens in the story and something happens as we're starting to get it on the page and we start to figure out that story isn't this thing. And again, Rachel, I see you nodding. So I'm going to ask you, have you ever had that moment where you think you're moving in one direction with a story and find you're going someplace else? Um, I I'm going to stop nodding, I think. <laughs> um, I, yes, though. Actually, um, I think stories always kind of do that for me. They begin about, they begin and they're about one thing. Um, and then they sort of become about a number of things as I'm, as I'm working. So, yeah. It isn't, uh, to me, that seems like that might be the most satisfying as well as terrifying when you realize, oh, it could be about this and it could be about this. Oh, shit, it could be about this and it could be about this. So, yeah. um, so along the lines of what we just, we've been talking about a little bit, what is it that gets the ink flowing for you? How do things start? Amy, you were talking about how you're kind of like, a magpie gatherer for a while and then enough th these things start to come together in a way and start to show themselves as whatever it is that you're going to be writing um but is it an image that comes to you first is it or does this shift is it a first line do you know your endings i'll start with you this time amy um i would say i almost never know my endings although i'll never forget like it, an awp maybe like 14 years ago or something like that. Uh, John Irving was giving like the keynote, which ended up being like about how to be him kind of. And, um, and he said that he starts with his last line. And I always, every time I start writing something, I'm like, that's so nuts. How could you start with your last line? But it, it, it would see how it would make a really tight story, uh, which might never are. But, um, but I think it's something for me, it's something different for each book. I just um, gave my fourth book to my agent to read. And that book was, uh, that was like the most satisfying writing process I've ever had. But it was also like the one, um, I don't know how the book is, because literally no one has read it yet. But, um, but it was one of those things where I was gathering these ideas for really years like you know how it is you have a notebook where you, you're just sort of gathering ideas and and um characters and lines here and there and i had this it has this main character who's uh it was like she just kept talking and her i just kept hearing her voice and i like loved her so much i was so excited when she would talk to me and um but and then it was like one day i just like couldn't i was like all right i wasn't gonna work on this yet but i just I can't hold it in. I gotta, I gotta write this. Um, but usually it doesn't feel that urgent. I don't know what happened with that book, but, um, but yeah, I think it's been really, it's been a really different process with every book I've written. And I think also, uh, and, and maybe this is true of the rest of the writers here too. When I think about it, each book I've written has been written in a, in like a different life. Like I've been living a very different life in each book like this um my book unseen city that's going to come out in september it took so long to write and it was written while you know i was home with small children and and i feel like when i look at it i can tell from the structure how it's written like it, it kind of is it's basically like two novels stuck together and it really is kind of written in like in modular chunks because that's what that's like the kind of time i had you know what i mean um, and my, and my novel before that, which is called The Mermaid of Brooklyn, is truly a really long short story. Like, it's one character, there's one story. It's over the course of the summer, it just goes, and that's, like, the book I was able to write when I had babies. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I think sometimes the shape of your life affects how the, the writing turns out, too. Um, Pi, I see you nodding. Do you agree? <laughs> 
I was just thinking, yes, we're all writing novels right now because we're all tied, stuck at home for such a long time. <laughs> of course, it's probably not true, but um, yeah. Yeah. People whose children are like, who don't have children or whose children are over a certain age. This is like good novel writing time. Yeah. People yeah. with I, small children are like, what? Flash fiction, maybe. Right. Yeah. Um, Sin, how about you? What's that, what's that process? What gets you going? And, and we can pull it over this idea too that Amy's talking about how the shape of our lives sometimes might affect the shape of our, uh, our work as well. Um, for me, it's an image. So, um, and it may be because I was trained this way at Columbia College in grad school to, you know, um, you see something and then you write what takes your attention, whatever's happening at that moment. And that's also how I teach when I teach writing now is, is I, my novel started because I saw a father falling off a ladder and dying while his kids on the swing watching for her birthday. And now I was like, eh. so then I just started writing from there and now it's 55,000 words, right? Um, it's always an image for me. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's really never dialogue. I also don't ever know where it's going ever. So um, it's pure discovery all the time. It's like, I, you know, I was dropped in the woods and just told to go, then I'm just going and I need to figure out how to get there. And that's how my stories how when I write, that's how they work. I just completely go wherever they tell me to go, especially first draft, um, because I feel like the first draft is all about discovery and not fighting the process. And then second draft and all the revisions, then you're really thinking about your audience and structure and how you want your audience to receive it. Um, so that's how my process has been. And then going um, to piggyback off of Amy, um, what I have noticed is my, wherever I am in my mental health is what my stories reflect when I've written them. So my short story collection, um, when people talk to me about it, they tell me how depressing it is. And um, I call it realistic, they call it depressing, but um, it's hard for me to go back and read some of those stories right now because mentally I'm in a much better place than I was. Um, I have depression and anxiety. So being able to be in therapy for the last two and a half years has given me clarity, which is so interesting when I'm going back looking at the work that I've written. But, you know, Patty knows this. She was, you know, my favorite professor is all my stories have some underlying yearning to belong and to be loved. And that's what my novel now is. But I can also, I have a little bit more distance from it. Um, which I think is always important when you're writing to have distance from your narrator, because it's not your story, it's your narrator's story. Absolutely. Rachel, um, what makes you get going to the page? What, what starts a story for you? <clears throat> um, I, I agree with, um, with Sin and Amy that it, that it varies. Um, you know, sort of by story, but um, I, I, one of the things I've noticed is that I'm always interested in um, how people um, recover or, or um, I guess, like the, the story that I read is called After, and I'm always interested in what happens after something um, traumatic or um, sad or um, so, so not the moment itself so much, um, but, but the repercussions of that moment. So, um, so situations, I guess, uh, situations and image uh, will get me started. Um, I'm doing a lot of research for the, the book that I'm doing right now, and that's always very inspiring. Um, a lot of reading nonfiction uh, about communities that have been affected by guns and gun violence. So. Thank you. Thank you. We're getting some questions and comments in the chat here. So I'm going to just read a couple of them and know that that's part of our conversation as well. So you've got that, you hit chat at the bottom of your screen on the toolbar. It'll pop up the chat that's coming up. So um, Kathleen Quigley. Hi, Kathleen. <laughs> Said, I think Toni Morrison said she begins with the ending. And then Anne-Marie Reynolds, Anne-Marie, 
Hi, Anne Marie um, says, has a question. Those of you who teach, do you find it helpful to work with students on their writing or does it interfere with your creative process? And I think each of you teach in different, uh, different venues, different, with different groups of learners. So um, Rachel, do you mind if I start with you this time? That's a great question, Anne-Marie. Um, Anne-Marie is a former colleague of mine, so she's probably heard me complain. <laughs> but um, uh, I, I, I love working with students on their writing, but I don't think it, um, I don't think it inspires my own work in any way. I think sometimes the same energy that I would use on my work, I end up giving to my students. So um, one of the things I try to do is do my own work first, do my own writing first in the morning if I can, before I get to uh, approaching, you know, student work. Um, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's always, it is always difficult to, to keep that concentration on your own work and still give all you need to give to your students. Perhaps even more, some of us are had to learn how to teach online in just about two minutes this semester. Yeah. And I had big plans for this spring. I was gonna get so much done. And uh, unfortunately, I had to learn how to teach online. And so that's kind of been all of my, my attention. Um, Amy, are you a teacher as well? Do you? I have taught, um, I, since, uh, let's see, since I've been in New York, which has been, a long time. I can't do math, but let's let's say 15 years. Um, I've only ever taught evening, like adult education classes, which I feel like is really different because um, the students that I've had through a writer's workshop called Sackett Street Writer's Workshop, um, and I've taught a couple like continuing ed classes at NYU and Gotham Writers Workshops. Um, they're like students who really, really want to be there. Um, and it's like they're paying for the class and going there after work. And I just feel like it brings like a different kind of student. Like they just, they're so into it. Um, but I do find it really, really exhausting. And um, and I think like reading any kind of work, like now I make my living as an editor, uh, which is so much easier than teaching <laughs> and, uh, and so much easier than writing too, I think. But it really, it's like anything that, any kind of writing that you're reading a lot, it, it's like, it definitely can infect your brain a little bit, just like the cadences and, you know, if you have a class of, terrible writers, which I know none of us ever has, but it, it like, you know, eats away at your brain a little bit. Um, and like the kind of editing work I do now, uh, I, I, I do a lot of like having to kind of strip out people's like darlings and their writing and make it super, super readable and, and super quick and um, sometimes a little newsy which sometimes kind of like hurts me a little bit. I'm like, oh, I know you felt so proud of that little metaphor in there. And that's like, I love that, but we got to take it out right now. <laughs> so I do feel like when I go back to my own writing, there's a little bit of like recalibrating. Um, but for me, those like, those times are so separate right now, you know, like during the, even though it's all happening in the same place. Um, but it's like my work time is, is so separate than my creative writing time that I feel like something is able to like switch in my brain that it doesn't affect it too much. But when I was teaching more, I found it just really exhausting. Um, yeah. I don't it's know hard to write, it. hard to write when you're exhausted. It's hard work. Good job guys. <laughs> and I know you've been teaching for Story Studio and have done a lot of community teaching along the way. How has that affected? what you're doing as a writer or does it affect what you're doing as a writer? I mean, I definitely, I do it, you know, maybe teach one class for six weeks and then I take a break off, you know, take a couple months off and do another one. But for me, I get super excited. So I'm a very, I feed off of energy. Um, I'm not an extrovert, but I like to be around that energy and I love to analyze things and try to figure out how to get 
um, the students, how much guidance do you give them and what tools do you give them in order for them to make discoveries on their own? Because I would love to be like, Ugh, don't do that and move this over here and all of this stuff. Um, but I really, it's a high for me. I love, I sit one-on-one -on -one with them. Um, I always say for five minutes, I end up 10 or 15 minutes with each person. But I talk to, their, uh, to them about their story. I ask them a lot of questions to see what discoveries they get on their own. And when I see that light bulb turn on, and it's a light bulb of confidence, not necessarily quality of work, but them believing in themselves that they can do it, then I tell myself, I need to practice what I preach. I can't go and tell them, you can do this, here's some tools, point out some places, and then not write myself. And I'm not a disciplined writer. I do not write every day. I wish I did, and I don't. And maybe I don't wish I did. I'm, this is why I'm the writer that I am, right? But when I teach, it is exhausting, but it is a high. And then I, it's like they motivate me to write. Because if I'm telling them, make sure that you focus on your dialogue and X, Y, and Z tools, and then I'm looking at my own work. If I'm pointing out their dialogue, is it a, you know, am I projecting that I also need help on my own? So for me, it's a lot of projection. What am I putting on them? And what do I care about their stories? Which means I need to make sure I care about my stories in the same way. Okay. Well, thank you for that. And Sin, I'm going to keep you on the hot seat here because uh, Sharon Kennedy has asked, would you ever, uh, for Sin, would you ever consider writing personal essays or a memoir or is that just out of the question? Um, great question, Sharon. Um, I have written uh, essays before. So um, I did a lot of uh, storytelling for um, uh, around the city yes thank you i'm totally blanking and it has to be memoir um so it's really hard for me to write personal essays because i know what they're all about pretty much and i rather create a world from scratch um and let it tell me where it wants to go where with my life i know how it happens but lately um and patty's a great personal essay writer. Lately, I have been thinking of possibly putting together, I have six personal essays that I could work on and then six more, but I don't really know why anyone would care <laughs> to read what, I mean, if you, honestly, if you all want to really know what my real life is, just read my fiction. <laughs> it's all in there somewhere. It's all in layers. Um, but I think eventually I'll get there if I feel like I have something to say. Thank you. Um, Gail has a question. Gail wallace Bizano. Hi, Gail. Uh, Gail has a question for Amy um, that might be tough to answer, she says, but do you think you could have envisioned a story similar to the last time we saw Rita if the pandemic had not occurred? That's a great question. And I think, unfortunately, the answer is yes. I, um, <laughs> I've written I don't know, there's always something creepy going on, particularly in my short stories. And actually, I was talking to the um, editor of People Holding, and he was like, oh, I wanted to share that story that you wrote for us a couple years ago, but it's actually way too on the nose. And it's it was supposed to be funny, but it's actually just really disturbing because it's about these, um, the picture was these like women in bikinis holding antlers. And I had written, I had imagined them in this sort of post-apocalyptic world, uh, specific, specifically after a virus has wiped out a lot of the uh, human population and, and they're like sort of the post-apocalyptic post -apocalyptic queens in this way. Um, and yeah, I feel like, um, I mean, I feel like we all do this, but weirdly, sometimes like you write the future in a weird way. Um, and sometimes when I go back and read older stories um, of mine, I don't know about my novels because I don't reread them because who could stand to do that? But um, when I reread short stories, I'm like, oh, why did, how did I know that? That's so unsettling. But I think that's the thing we all do in our writing in a weird way. But yeah, yeah, I'm a creep. Thank you. Um, it's sort of a, on the 
Same vein from Gail. I'm curious to hear how the pandemic and shelter in place is affecting everyone's work, both in terms of process and content. And Rachel, would you mind? Sure. Um, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a coffee house writer. Like I like to go to the coffee house with my, um, my group who, uh, one of them is here, I think, just yay, Gail, Hosking. Um, we're the, we call ourselves the Boulder Collective. Um, and we meet in the mornings and we write together. And so it's been really hard to not have that great support, you know, that accountability, knowing that um, there are people waiting for me somewhere, that there's a, a cup of coffee with my name on it too. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to get back to writing after the world's longest semester um, and craziest semester too. And um, one of the things I'm doing is, um, is revising. That's helping me get back into these stories. Um, and I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I feel like everything's so unsettled right now in the world and I sadly require a certain degree of calm um, to get to work. So I'm gonna have to figure out how to, how to move forward without that calm and without the coffee house. So I'm not sure, but right now it's just been revision. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, Sin, how about you? How has this pandemic affected both what, perhaps what you're writing or has it affected what you're writing or your process? Um, with my process, I, ha my writing room is now my office and I never wanted the two worlds to ever, um, even come very close to one another. Um, so I don't like that. I have two monitors right now and on top of files, it just really annoys me and I feel like I can't break it. Um, so that's kind of hard because I always wanted to, this to be my creative room. Um, and I have an 11 year old daughter and my husband's here and a dog and a cat and a hamster. So that 24 hours a day, it's, it's actually taken me up until last week to figure out a routine that works for everyone and it's not driving me crazy. Um, so I haven't written too much for, during the quarantine, but like Rachel, what I am doing is revising. I took my novel, I printed the whole thing, I went through the whole thing and wrote down what scene was what, and I started figuring out structure. Um, and then writing out what gaps I have, because I only write what takes my attention. So obviously there's gonna be little gaps there. Um, and so that has helped me keep my creativity up. Um, but the but I don't have any need to write about the quarantine or characters in quarantine, though I'm teaching a class in July <laughs> and it's all going to be prompts. And I think we're going to see a lot of little like quarantine stories. So um, to me, it's just not being able to separate my life where I wear all these hats um, to the writer hat. Okay. Amy, how about you? Um, you know, I think when I think about it abstractly, it's hard, you know, it's just, it's always hard when the world feels really crazy to, um, you know, to, to not get stuck in that trap of like, oh, well, who cares about my little thing that I'm making up? Um, but in practice, I'm sort of horrified to see that like it's great for me. Um, just like having like the the sort of distractions of New York City are not there because I can't go there. It's like I don't even live there right now. Um, and it actually like, you know, having time and just knowing that the only option I have is to be home and sit and write has actually been been really good um and i've i've been uh weirdly it's like kicked into into gear something that i've been working on for actually years that i have bits and pieces of and um all these notes and parts of it written which is a book that i've been trying to write a nonfiction book 
what about um, extremely long term projects, and I couldn't, I, I could never like get traction on it, and and I was, you know, spread the whole thing out on the floor, and suddenly realized like it's about how to keep going, and about how to believe in a future, which feels very relevant right now. Um, and I feel like I don't, I don't know if it'll ever actually congeal into a book, but it for me it's been um, a really interesting process of discovery. As I think Rachel was saying, there's something great about writing towards a discovery, and uh, like I'm just writing it to figure out how do you keep going and how do you just keep believing that there's a long future. Um, so, yeah. I, uh I'll let you guys know. <laughs> I'd, li I'd like to actually turn that question back to all of you who are here. I'm assuming that many of you are here because you are writers or, or wanting to be writers or wanting to be writing writers um, during all of this. And how has this time, this enforced um, staying at home or this decision to stay at home, how has it affected the work that you're doing, your own process? Does anybody want to talk about that a little bit? Just let us know and we'll unmute you. I'll go. Um, well, I suck because I haven't written much at all. I tried to edit a little bit, but I just find that even reading is hard right now. So I've been listening to tons of podcasts. I listened to Circe by Madeline Miller, you know, so I just got like, went off with Odysseus. And, you know, so it's just, I've just been trying to honor the fact that right now, it's just not the time. And um, so I signed up for the Story Studio Chicago thing, thinking, okay, here's a goal. So I worked on editing something, sent off the application, fingers crossed. But really, it's just I'm not trying to beat myself up too much right now. That's a, that's a good plan, Kathleen. Jan, I saw that you had your hand up too. Would you How's that? Am I there? Okay. <clears throat> I relate to all of that. <clears throat> At first, I couldn't write a thing. It was just overwhelming. I could barely read. But <clears throat> I started getting a sense that, boy, I mean, life is short. And uh, I have this sort of urge now in this sense that if, you know, nobody's asking me to do this, but if I don't do it now, it's not going to get done. So there is a kind of <clears throat> Uh, compulsion to get it out there. I'm not saying anything that I'm, that I'm feeling necessarily good about what I'm doing, but it is, has been a little change. I must say that my life, I'm retired. I live at home with my husband. Now our, our sons are here. My life has not changed a whole lot in the quarantine. So it's not like I've had to balance teaching and young children and all of that. So I have it relatively easy, but it has been a sense that better get on it. And, and again, with no judgment of anyone and total understanding of the fact that it's really hard and that nobody should beat themselves up if they aren't able to do it. But I don't know. That's where I am right now. So. No. Um, Gail had put up, uh, uh, Gail over here, who's asked a couple of these questions, had put up a post on Facebook where Facebook friends and friends and uh, it, was a, it was somebody in a rowboat in a bunch of water with stuff floating all around, you know, obviously a flood. And the guy says, I think it's time for me to start my novel now, which is kind of the way I think uh, I've been feeling. Um, and, and I know quite a few people are feeling. It's like, well, I've got this time, so now I should be writing. But, you know, everything is falling apart around me. You know, yeah. one, one thing I just quickly is it's removing the should from our language because the should brings guilt and then guilt freezes people. So we should be working on our novel. We should be spending quality time with our children 24 hours a day. We should be exercising. And when that's not realistic because we're all in a time of uncertainty that no one expected and we're not prepared for, then the shoulds bring guilt. And then the guilt will affect people in different ways, but it's still guilt and guilt isn't healthy. And then nothing happens, right? And then it starts all over. I shouldn't feel guilty <laughs> about X, Y, and Z. So Kathleen, you don't suck. 
you just are, we're all surviving in the way that we know how. And whether that means some of us can write a thousand words a day or some of us don't write for 10 weeks, um, just realizing that we're doing what we can should, not should, see there goes my should, realizing that we're doing what we can is what matters, not the shoulds that we feel like we have to, because the shoulds also come with comparison. Well, they're doing it, I should be doing it too. And I think that it, that also causes a lot of the guilt and self-esteem that can stop people from doing things. I'm also trying to practice what I'm preaching, so. <laughs> Gail, I see, your, I see your hand up, Gail. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yeah, okay, I'll chime in since I asked the question of everybody. Um, and I really like what Sin is saying about shoulds because that's it right there. Um, as far as my own process, I, I see this like over the past, I don't know however many months it's been, a couple, almost three, um, is kind of like an ebb and flow. So I've written a few short pieces during an online flash fiction class I was taking back in April and lately I've not been writing much. Um, I'm dealing with some kind of intense family stuff right now. So for some weird reason, feel compelled to write about that. Um, so it's just, for me, it's sort of like, well, okay, this is kind of crazy. And it's, it is like being in a, um, out on a little boat in some kind of crazy weather and we're just all trying to survive it. And I'm kind of trying to ride the waves and, so some days I, I have creative spurts and some days not, and that's okay. Thank you, Gail. Thanks for the question as well. I think um, this whole idea of should, we should be doing this, you know, that there's that idea of uh, um, ambition and also that idea of accomplishment that we're always measuring ourselves against. But one of the things that I always remind myself of as a writer is how important reading is to that process as well. That always feels like a guilty pleasure. So it's kind of a groovy double-edged sword. You know, you get to have a little of the pleasure at the same time that you're actually learning from it. And um, I'm wondering if each of you, Rachel and Sin and, and uh, Amy and anybody else who might want to weigh in on, on this as well, if there are, um, cult, since we're talking about short stories, are there collections of short stories, maybe not the usual suspects that we're reading that you would recommend. We sent a few of these to um, Christy and she's added them to the PDF, but maybe we could just take a minute to talk about those things that, that we are reading and that we would encourage each other to read. The nice thing about reading short stories is that you don't have to commit. It's not like a marriage, right? You don't have to commit to, um, to getting it all done before you move on to the next thing. You can dip into a few of them. Uh, along the way. So I'm going to start with you, Rachel. What are some of the suggestions you have for collections of short stories? Um, well, I have a stack of books by me because um, I, I was going to write it down and then I, I ran out of time and I just, so I just grabbed the books, which is, I guess, a benefit to the, to the Zoom uh, reading. So um, this is one of my favorites by uh, Erica Dreyfus, who's here with us today, actually, in the audience. Quiet Americans, it's a really beautiful collection. Um, this is another one, The Dew Breaker by Edwin Danticat, another book that was uh, really important to me as I was shaping uh, my collection heirlooms because they're connected stories, linked stories. Um, you'll notice these are all women. I do have some men in the stack. Um, this is Jean Thompson who uh, is in my, I think is in the link that Christie's um, putting together, right? Or, or has in the chat. Anyway, um, Jean Thompson's an amazing writer and so few people know about her and her stories I think are especially great. She's got six collections. So if you don't know her, you're in for a real treat. Um, this is um, a, another collection that I really love, um, The Glass Labyrinth by Charlotte Holmes. And um, my lovely um, publisher, Bookmark Press, put this book out. And I see also that my editor, Ben Furnish, is here, which is especially sweet. Hi, Ben. Uh, another book I love, The Pale of Settlement by Margot Singer. 
This is um, another small press book, University of Georgia. Um, I could keep going, but maybe I should let someone else in. But, but I do want to mention um, one more, uh, Lucy Honig, um, her collection, uh, The Truly Needy and Other Stories, which won the Drew Hines, I think in 1999. Um, but she's got other books out there too. Um, so, oh, and I said I, said I had a boy. Um, so one more, uh, Steve Almond, um, I'm a big fan of his short stories. This is um, God Bless America. Also, small press um, but from Lookout Books, so. Um, Rachel, I just edited something by Steve Almond for work, like in, uh, this beautiful essay that he wrote. So exciting, what a small world. Yeah, he's great, he's really yeah. great. He can do everything, which is like annoying, but good, good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I, I no, while you're unmuted there, Amy, what are some of the titles that you might recommend? I just grabbed some off my shelf because I was like, I, I couldn't remember actually what I, um, what I had sent Christy. Um, but I loved this collection of short stories, Heads of the Colored People by Nafisa Thompson Spires. Um, if you haven't read it, it's just beautiful. And you know what's funny when I think about it, I think each of these books is something that like got me out of a reading rut. Um, I was like, I just came to this book in a moment when I was just having a really hard time reading anything. And my only reading time was on the train when I used to ride the train, which now seems like horrible. But, um, and so I read, and short stories are like the perfect commute reading. And, and this book really like shifted something in my head. Um, they're like very, they're just, they're books that you can read on a crowded train and they'll make you think all day, which is like, I don't know how she did that. Um, and I also have How to Leave Hylea by a graduate school uh, classmate of mine, Janine Capote Crusette. Um, great, she's just like one of those writers who, you know, the first seminar we had together, you know, you just read, like each of her stories had such a strong voice. Um, it was like, I, I just know the first story I read from her in class, I was like, oh, she's gonna have a book. This is like the real deal. You know how you know sometimes? And then I just saw this and grabbed this. This is um, a very underrepresented uh, white man, um, J. Robert Lennon, who I um, I actually, this is another book that, that was very helpful to me in, in a time of a horrible reading rut. Actually, it's called Pieces for the Left Hand and they're very short, very strange short stories. Um, that I, they were like the only thing I could read when I was uh, nursing my baby, who's 11 now. So I don't, I, I can't, I don't know if they hold up or if they're as interesting when you don't have like weird nursing hormones in your head. Um, but the, it was like an important book in, in that way for me that I was like, this I can read. And, um, and they're, they're, he has like such a weird, amazing mind. So yeah, it's like reading Rainbow. Did he do? Great, thank you. Um, and I see you're talking about the underrepresented white male. Gail has suggested The Horse Child by Richard Russo um, as one as well. And then Anne-Marie Reynolds says the composer Maurice Ravel wrote pieces for the left hand. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, Sid, how about your pieces, um, your choices? So I have realized now that we're talking, I am reading way more because I can't read on the train because I'm getting old and I get motion sickness. So I now read a lot in the bathtub, which is my escape from everything. Um, I'm doing a lot of rereading of the books that I have because I always think it's great to go back and see if you get the same emotional reaction. And then you, you know, you should, if you're a writer, you should read as a writer so that you can pick up how people are getting stuff on the page. Um, I reread Patty's collection, The Temple of Air, which I highly recommend. It's fabulous. Um, I believe in reading authors that don't look like me. So um, on the PDF, I have recommended Safar, um, Sahar Mustafa's Code of the West. Um, she's an amazing writer. Her novel just came out. Um, I think if we keep reading books by people that are the same color of us or by men, <laughs> um, it's going to stifle uh, 
your own creativity and your own knowledge of what the literary world can bring to to the real world so i highly recommend you know reading black authors reading you know muslim authors just we all have read the white man we've all done it so maybe you know uh it's a little goal during the quarantine to go get a book by someone that doesn't look like you and someone from an independent publisher because not everyone who's fabulous is publishing with these big publishing houses. There's a lot of fabulous people in the independent. Um, and the third one I'll recommend, which won't be a surprise to Patty at all, is um, Chekhov. <laughs> he is like, just checking for my husband, he is like, ugh. I love this man and he's not alive, but um, highly recommend Chekhov. His stories just have always inspired me to be a short story writer and the emotion that's in there is amazing. Um, and one of my favorite stories, if you guys wanna look for it, it's very short, it's called Heartache um, by Chekhov. And it's just, it's amazing what he does with emotion and I'm all about making connection and emotion, hopefully between myself and my readers. That's great. He is um, a white man though, sorry. <laughs> I, I feel He's like a dead I love, white man. Yeah, I love Chekhov um, as like a, a role model for a writer with a day job. Like I'm always oh. looking for those writers with day jobs and you know, he was a doctor, he had a pretty serious day job. Um, and I love just like what he was able to do on the side, as many of us are doing. Uh, Sin mentioned Sahar Mustafa and her collection, Code of the West. I'm um, thrilled to say that she was actually my MFA student and that was her thesis collection, but her book, her novel that just came out a month ago in the middle of all of this, The Beauty of Your Face. Rachel, it starts with a school shooter, so it might be interesting for you to read, but it's, a, it's really an education in, um, the young suburban Muslim girl, and it's it's just beautiful. Um, it's already been translated into Italian, and it's going to be coming out in the UK pretty soon. She just got reviewed in the New York Times Book Review, which is and it is an editor's choice. So uh, I know we're talking about short stories, but it's interesting to look at her short stories and then look at the longer work as well and see how they they kind of um, come together. Um, so Christy says, I'm currently reading Teresa Milbrut's Instances of Head Switching by Shade Mountain Press, a wonderful collection of imaginative stories about disability and emotions and visits from the gods who show up on the news and in your living room. So that sounds like a great, great selection as well. Um, I'm going to turn to Christy to see uh, what she thinks our timing should be, if we want to keep going, do we want to move forward? Um, well, it's just, it's 320, so um, if there's any more questions, this would be a great time for the audience to to pop in. Um, you know, um, it's certainly everybody sticking around, which, which always tells me that this is a really engaging discussion because usually, you know, I said an hour and when we go over, I'm always like, ooh, that's because we're all having so much fun connecting. So um, that's, we can maybe just have one more quick question and then I can close things out and I'm going to drop the PDF in the chat box just one more time so that you can all open it up, download it, do what you want to and make sure you have access to all the links. So Amy has a question. I forgot, I have a question. Um, for the, uh, for Rachel and Sin, and anyone else here who's published a, a book of short stories, I'm, I've am i published a lot of short stories in a lot of different places. Um, and, but I'm always so curious about, but I don't, I'm not sure if they are a book. So I know this is a real like, amateur question I'm just gonna ask you like how did you put together your collections of short stories did you envision them did you write them to be linked um, when when did you know they were a collection that was like nine questions how do I make a book of short stories tell me yeah so Rachel you want to start us um, sure sure so um, the, my collection um, heirlooms, which I will show you the cover of, um, started, I had just written one story and I thought I was sort of done with that material. And, and maybe this is the, the place where someone else would say, oh, I'm not done with that material, I'll 
write a novel. But instead, I wrote a story with the same characters that took place like, you know, 50 some years later, right? So I had, and then I realized I had bookends. And then I, so I wrote stories to fill in between. Um, so that's what I did, but I, I always feel like I should say, I didn't really know that that's what I was doing. And I don't know that it's a great way <laughs> to work. Um, but that's, that is what I did with that story. And, it, it, and they're chronological, the stories move chronologically within that collection and they're the same, mostly the same characters. Um, so so that, that's how I knew that that was a collection. And then um, the, the book that I'm working on right now is, is also linked, but not with the same characters. It's only linked in that um, all of the stories involve gun violence of one sort or another. And I, um, I, re I realized that I had all these stories to write about gun violence um, because I had been on uh, jury duty and, you know, in jury duty, they ask you, um, it's like a routine question, have you or anyone you love um, been the victim of um, a violence or, you know, a crime, a violent crime? And I, I said, oh, no, you know, and then they, and I got to be on the jury. Um, and then I got home that night and I thought, oh, my God. And I could suddenly list off all of these friends and family who had been victims of violent crimes, including, you know, someone I'd grown up with who had been murdered. Um, and I had somehow completely forgotten because to, to live in the world that we all live in, right, where people are dying all the time from gun violence, you kind of have to forget. So then I, when I started listing the stories, I realized, oh, this is, <laughs> this is another collection. So I don't know if that's helpful it's more anecdotal than uh, useful. I don't know. I hope it helps. <laughs> um, with my collection, it was actually my thesis. So I, I knew that I wanted to do a short story collection. Um, and I had been producing a lot of short stories in my classes. So I actually wrote maybe 24, 25 short stories because I knew that not all of them would go in and I didn't know how they would all fit together because they don't have the same characters. They're not in the same locations. I mean, a couple take place in Central America and a couple you know, are in Chicago, but there's really nothing in common um, except all my narrators um, are met with a challenge emotionally that they need to figure out how they're gonna transform into the next phase. Um, so when I sat down with all the stories, I really then had to think, um, I can't have too many first person, I can't have too many third person, I want to show off the second person, you know, how many young narrators do I have, I tend to like to write the young narrator to the older, so it became much more um, strategic when I had this big group of stories to work with, as in what would complement and go together, and what do I want to show off as a writer, um, and which ones have to stay in and which ones should come out. I will say, um, I am very proud of my collection with Curbside, but um, being a first time author, I agree to things I really didn't want to agree to. So the, the first story, did not have the original ending. They cut it, they, the editor's like, no, we should cut it here. And I've always regretted that, always. Um, and it was not in the uh, order I wanted it in. And they left out in a story um, that other people were like, why wasn't that story in there? And I am looking to uh, have that a second edition printed with a different independent publisher. So I'm in discussions with this publisher and I said, you know, hey, why don't we talk about this? And he's like, yes. And I said, okay, but these five things need to happen if we're gonna get them published. So I need the original ending. I, need, I told him everything. And he's like, put it together the way you want and then let's talk. And it was so freeing to be able to say, I'm so proud of A, 
But if we're going to produce B five years later, it needs to be a reflection of who I am today. And that would be someone, I'm very flexible and I'm listening, but these five things were very important to me. And it's my fault, not curbsides, that I didn't say no, I really need to. And so far, uh, Sahar talks about that too. She has mentioned that um, she wrote a story maybe it was the novel about the Muslim girl and a publisher said, I'll take it, but you need to make the girl white or something like that. And she's like, that's not going to happen. So it's really knowing when to stand your ground and knowing when it's constructive feedback. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question either, but you know, with, it's going to be interesting what I decide to bring in or leave out or the order. So it's almost like I, I'm doing it all over again for this second edition that hopefully will happen. Mm -hmm. uh, Julie suggests a craft essay by David Joust, Stacking Stories about how to structure a story collection. It's in his book Alone with All That Can Happen. So there's a, I'm going to read that myself. Uh, I, my collection of stories that's coming out right now, I'm in the editing process. And uh, I'm a little nervous. It's a, it's a teaching press. And so I feel like the students are going to want to try to teach me and I'm gonna to wanna to try to teach them and I have to remember what Sin just said to be aware of what I really want the book to be and to, to stand my ground that way as well. Um, can I do a little shameless self-promotion, Christy, do you mind? <laughs> so probably a number of you here are, um, are already writers, but maybe you're in that place in your, your pandemic life where you're looking for a way to kind of shake things loose and I'll be teaching a flash forms six week course for the Connecticut Literary Festival um, starting in July. So um, if you're interested in that, give it a look. Tomorrow for Shake Rag Alley, which is in Mineral Point, Wisconsin, um, I'll be doing a prompt workshop uh, from 1230 to, to 3. Uh, it may say that it's closed in registration, but if you reach out to them, they'll reach out to me and we can probably make some space if you're interested in that. So, um, and it helps me to work with all of you in order to remember that work is important. This work is important. There's a lot of important things going on right now, but I think that this work, uh, it, it's easy to convince ourselves that it's not important, but I think that it really is. So I'm gonna turn it back to Christy then. And really wanna thank Sin and Rachel and Amy for their mm -hmm. brilliance, to hear their work, and then also to hear what they had to say about making the work. Um, and thanks to all of you for your questions and for weighing in with your own process as well and for those things that are taking your attention. And especially thanks to Christy Craig, who is going to be doing this again tomorrow with another group of writers. So thanks, Christy. I'm muted. Here I am. Thank you, Patty, for moderating such a great discussion. Thank you, Sin and Rachel and Amy for sharing your work. Um, and I've taken classes with Patty before. She's awesome. So if you are available and around, certainly check out her workshops. Um, we do have another reading tomorrow, same time, same place, 2 p.m. at Shuli K. Wood. She's going to be reading from her book called A Small Thing to Want, which is a Press 53 publication. Um, again, I, I just want to say be sure to download the PDF, which has links to everything that you could possibly want including the reading list and well read black girl which i mentioned earlier in the in the in the event here and it's a great way to get yourself familiar with stories that maybe you're not familiar with so that you can be a wonderful upstander and a great ally for um, the people in our communities who are suffering and i just also want to um say thank you for talking about the process. I really love that idea of surviving during this time, however we need to, whether that's writing, reading, and connecting, which is exactly why I really enjoy putting on these online events. So everyone, wonderful to have you here. This is recorded. You can always go to the Hidden Timber Books website, check out the other recordings on our YouTube channel. I hope to see you here again. And um, I'll be here to hang out for a minute if the other authors wanna just debrief. But also, if you need a minute to download anything or catch names and titles of things from the chat box, you can do that real quick before I close everybody down. And thanks again for being here. Have a wonderful Sunday or Saturday afternoon. Thank, Thank you so much, Christy. Thank you for coming, everyone. Thank you.